Hi, podcast listeners. Welcome to the A World of Difference podcast. We have so many guests on this show making a difference in our lives, making a difference all around the world with the expertise that they bring. And yet so many of you are reaching out to me saying, you want more. It's not enough just what we're putting on these podcast episodes for you. And so I am here to extend a very warm welcome to you to our Difference Maker community where you can join for as little as $5 a month to get all this extra content out the gate, you're going to get 30 plus mini sods of exclusive content not available for the regular podcast listeners and an exclusive mini sode every month. And you'll get exclusive voting power to help us pick podcast topics and more. And that's with our changers tier. There's three different main tiers and then an extra uh, larger tier. But whatever tier that you join at, you will be included in this extra content and I know that many of you are wanting to go a little bit deeper. And so even though it gets a little wild in there sometimes because of how deep we go, I want you to join us there. This extra content is very special. It means a great deal to me to be a part of this community with you. And I would love to just exchange uh, ideas or perspectives that you have around these different episodes. And that's the place where we do it. So please show up to our Difference Maker community. Give us $5 out of your pocket every month. And I think that you'll have a lot of fun in there because we do. And I would love for you to join us. So go to patreon.com slash a world of difference to join us there. Welcome to the A World of Difference podcast. I'm your hostess, Lori Adams Brown, and you're listening to episode 32. If you're thinking of starting a podcast, I recommend Anchor. And I also recommend starting a podcast because it's tons of fun. Anchor has been a great place for me getting started because it's free. They have creation tools that basically let you record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. They distribute it basically everywhere for you. And you've basically got all you need to make a podcast just right in one place. So go to the Anchor app or anchor.fm to get started. Our guest on today's show is a very special guest who is coming to us for no doubt in my mind for such a time as this. Dr. Diane Langberg is a world-renowned expert on abuse of power, and she is an internationally recognized psychologist and experienced counselor who speaks on abuse and trauma all around the world. In her travels, she's visited the killing fields of Cambodia. She sat with victims to hear and listen in her research and in her practice. And she's helped many pastors overcome issues that they didn't even realize they were facing in the areas of abuse, of power and spiritual abuse and various kinds of abuse. So many of these pastors have not realized what they are doing and how they are using power to harm others. And she's helped to set them free and their congregations free all around the world. She directs her own counseling practice and co-founded the Global Trauma Recovery Institute at Missio Seminary in Philadelphia. And she's also on the board of Grace, which if you haven't heard of that, it's been in the news quite a bit lately with a lot of the church abuse scandals in the last few years. Um, It's godly response to abuse in a Christian environment, and it's led by Baz Chavitijan, and um, she also co-chairs the American Bible Society's Trauma Advisory Council. She's written numerous books, but I must say her latest book, Redeeming Power, Understanding Authority and Abuse in the Church, has been such a gift to so many. I have a friend, or a man I went to seminary with, and he has said he's been waiting 45 years for this book. She, she really just, in all of her decades of experience, helps us understand how power can be used for good and not to harm. So today is going to be an episode where we dig into some really hard things. And I just want to be mindful of the fact that there are some of you listening who within the church or maybe in your own homes or in, um, you know, a sports team you were on. I mean, various places where abuse of power could have taken place. Just I'm recognizing that it's a very sensitive topic. And so you know, no worries if you, if this isn't something you can hear today and that you could, you just even want to come back to it later or never, that's okay. You, you do what you need to do to help yourself 
have the healing that you need. But if this is an opportunity for you to learn and uh, grow and understand what experts are saying around this topic, Dr. Diane Lamberg is here for us. If you need to pause it, come back, you know, take a break and come back, that's okay. But she's here today to share her wisdom and her knowledge and how she sees what God has given and entrusted to us in the area of power as something to be used for good and not for harm. So welcome to today's show, Dr. Diane Langberg. Hi, Dr. Langberg. Thanks for coming on the show today. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Well, um, I know who you are, and a lot of people I know know who you are because you are just an amazing person who's really dedicated your life to a lot of really important topics um, that you've researched and written about. But for my listeners who don't know who you are yet, why don't you just tell us about yourself, your background, your family, and the work that you do? I'm I'm a psychologist, and uh, I started out in the early 1970s as a with a master's degree and then a PhD at a time when there were very few women in the field and also a time when the church was not very welcoming of people who called themselves psychologists. Um, And also a time when uh, trauma was not yet acknowledged. Um, So there's been a lot of changes and I've done the work for almost 50 years, 48 this year. Um, I've traveled the globe um, because church here and around the world has wanted to learn about trauma in recent years and uh, have a group practice outside Philadelphia with about 17 colleagues. Um, And I uh, have worked a great deal with leadership, churches, Christian organizations, um, which grew out of my work with victims, victims of sexual abuse, domestic violence, and then other kinds of abuse over time. And then the churches that those things happened in and the churches where those things were covered up. So that's brought me to a whole different world and uh, it seems to be my place these days is speaking out about the body of Christ that doesn't look like its head. Hmm. Yeah, I just wanna commend you because it's, it's not an easy work to do, to listen to some of the things you have to listen to when it comes to trauma and abuse. It's not really the kind of thing you probably grow up as a little girl saying, hey, one day I just wanna hear about all these terrible things and help, help people work it out. But we need people like you. And certainly you must have a lot of job security this year because it is just everywhere. And I'm sure you're getting a lot of opportunities to share. And I just wanna thank you because it's not easy to be that voice, but we really need it. So first of all, Thank you for that. But I do want to just start with this question, because as a person who's been a pastor in a church here in the U.S. now for about a year and a half, um, you know, one of the things I've noticed is there's a lot of different interpretations about spiritual authority. And um, I'd love for you to describe how spiritual authority can actually be misused by even well-meaning leaders who are actually end up causing harm to others. Uh, Yes, I mean, spiritual authority can be misused, not just by well-meaning leaders, but well-meaning parents, you know, well-meaning educators, all kinds of people in different positions, who uh, at times, sometimes on purpose and sometimes blind to themselves, use their authority to coerce, to manipulate, um, and use spiritual language in the doing of it which is very confusing to the sheep and often shuts them up and makes them think that what's being demanded of them is actually righteous when it is not. And that goes all the way out on the extreme of the continuum, which I think most of us would be appalled by. So I've spent years working with abuse victims and some of those have been women whose pastors have demanded sex from them and use spiritual language and spiritual authority to justify what they're doing. There's probably not too many people who would say that was okay. Yeah. (laughs) But that continuum goes down to much more subtle things as well, which are easier to ignore or silence, cover up, and even to cover up in ourselves. 
you know, we, we don't see what we're doing clearly, though we might see it if it were more extreme. Um, so it, it can be pretty rampant. And we fool ourselves and tell ourselves that what we're doing is for the good of the sheep. Yeah, I, I, I know that from what I've read and from some of the things I've seen, it can often be really confusing when it's on the lower end of that spectrum, what you're talking about. Um, I mean, certainly when it's sexual abuse, but um, I'd love for you to describe, um, there's a phrase spir spiritual abuse, which I think is more commonly known maybe this year than it has been in, in the past, but some people may not be familiar with that phrase, but just describe to us what spiritual abuse is and why so often it seems pastors and other church leaders might not even realize that they're actually abusing people in this way. Well, let's start with the fact that to abuse somebody means to mistreat them or use them wrongly. And, you know, we use that word pretty loosely without really thinking about what it means. So what you're talking about is spiritual things used to mistreat someone or use them wrongly, which ought to be a staggering oxymoron. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, and, and abuse of any kind generally uh, involves things like manipulation or coercion, um, force, whatever. So spiritual abuse means using spiritual words, scripture, um, other things that have a spiritual flavor to them, um, like saying I'm your shepherd or whatever, and then using that platform to do something abusive. It's extremely damaging to other people because they get so confused because this is the shepherd or the leader or whatever. This is somebody who's using God's word or at least words that I'm familiar with in the Christian world. But what they're doing doesn't seem right. It doesn't feel right. And one of the other pieces that often goes with that, if I speak up and say, ouch, basically, I'm silenced. I don't understand. I'm proving my rebellion, all kinds of things. So when somebody hurts us and won't hear us about the hurt, something is very wrong. Hmm. Yeah. And we're seeing it happen over and over again right now. Um with social media being a way for people to, to share their story, but still the silencing, the character assassination, um, even some of the gaslighting you're just mentioning, it's still so so common from what we're seeing out there. Um, especially, in, I mean, you have the post Ravi Zachariah situation, which involved sexual abuse, but that wasn't the only kind of abuse there. There was abuse of power, there was spiritual abuse, and Sometimes it does seem to start small. Maybe those are the early red flags that lead to something bigger. I don't know. What's your experience with that? Usually that's true. I mean, people don't generally just wake up one morning and decide to be sexually abusive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we get there little by little and we get there through deception. And initially we deceive ourselves. You know, I, I'm doing this thing which could be down low on the continuum, so to speak, but I'm doing this thing because I've worked so hard and I'm exhausted or whatever. We tell ourselves things. And then over time, if it pokes at us a little bit, we increase what we tell ourselves. And then eventually if somebody confronts us, we tell them, you know, why would you want to injure somebody who loves God and is working for him? Or look at this ministry. If you, if you talk about these things in public, you'll destroy this ministry, which will be hurtful to God kinds of things. So we deceive other people. And oftentimes people are invested in being deceived because they love their church or organization or circle or whatever they're in. They hear all the spiritual language and they want it to be true. They're longing for it. And so they choose to believe the lie. And then you end up eventually with systemic abuse, because if enough people do that, it just runs rampant through the whole system. And the system actually ends up supporting deception and abuse, sometimes for decades, until somebody comes along and says, enough, this is wrong, which is what Jesus did in the temple. You know, he went in and he cracked whips and turned tables over. He said, enough, this is the father's house and it looks nothing like the father. 
and they didn't listen because he came back and did it a second time. And they didn't listen and he wept, but he never went back. He never went back. Mm. So he has shown us that those things are in the house of God. And he has shown us that making a racket about it is actually godly, <laughs> which usually somebody who's making a racket about it is told they're not godly because we want to preserve the external church. We have a big church, we have a lot of people, it brings in people, we have great music, we have a lot of money. That's all evidence of God's blessing, which it's not. And if you do this, you're going to destroy God's house and his name, which you're not. He's the God of truth. Um, but it's very confusing to many people. And uh, they want it not to be true. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it, it goes on both sides, right? It, it's not just, you couldn't just blame one person in a system like that. You know, say for example, it is maybe, um, you know, in some cases a lead pastor who's being spiritually abusive or abuse of power or something like that. And then there's the people around them, like you're saying that they, they enjoy the fruits of this mm -hmm. system. Um, and, and so it does, it almost takes two to tango, at least two, sometimes more. And that's, that's where it's really hard for these who are being abused to come forward if they're going to be portrayed as not being godly, like you said, when in fact they're feeling compelled by the Holy Spirit to bring out the truth, even with grace and love, um, but still be attacked. But let's, let's talk about power. I know that's a place you've camped out for a long time and you've said, you know, written a lot about it. Talk to us about like, what is it about power that so often leads to the abuse of it? Well, it started in the beginning. Um, if you go back to Eden, when the enemy approached Eve with deception and an abuse of power. And, you know, he, he said, I want to be like the most high. I want to have the most power that there is. So he went in with God's words and twisted them a bit. And she followed him. Power like that is never satisfied. You're always afraid. You're always afraid somebody will find out you're a fraud or think you're a fraud. You're always afraid people will take it away from you. You're always afraid that the kingdom that you've built will fall. Um, and so you want more power to protect yourself and your institution or whatever it is. Your place, your esteem, you know, your... Uh, reputation, all of those things. And it never satisfies. It was never meant to satisfy. It doesn't satisfy a soul. And so, and, and you certainly don't want anybody to know you're vulnerable in those positions or anything like that. And so we do everything we can, not only to protect our power, but to increase it, often out of fear, certainly out of arrogance as well. But there's fear in there. Mm. And it's yeah. not enough. It's never enough. Yeah, what you say rings so true. Um, I mean, you're certainly the expert in terms of all the psychology of it and all the nuances there, but it all rings true because we've seen and known powerful people who are insatiable. Um, and, you know, even some very powerful men with lots of influence and money, you know, getting close to them, sometimes they just seem like little fearful boys, you know, and well, sometimes they are sometimes that's yeah. how they grow up, which is what makes them hungry for power. Those wounds have never been looked at or dealt with. I think somewhere in the book, I put down some questions for leaders to ask themselves, which involve their history and things like that. And so that damage those wounds and the vulnerability that they bring. Uh, there's no open door to go there because it's threatening and, and frightening. So yeah, if someone challenges that, then they, they can tend to really fight because it's so oh, sure. Mm. Yeah, and I, I guess if, um, if it's in a church setting, right, it can leave a lot of victims in their wake. And when we're talking about, so in this series on my podcast, we're in a women in the church series and, you know, just sociology is my background. And so, you know, we know that there is a social hierarchy when it comes to gender, Um and race. <laughs> yes. and, and so, you know, white male pastors who tend to, white middle-aged male pastors are kind of the norm, it seems. 
but the church is largely made up of women who do a lot of the work, um, maybe not mm -hmm. without, not with as much of the status or the authority or the salary, but so much of the work is, is done by women. And so often, you know, we have these cases coming out with these, if you have, if we're talking about a, a pastor who's carried a womb since his childhood about power and a, and a woman tries to challenge that in any way, like she, there is an inequality there between the two of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's where it can get, it's more than sinful. It's more systemic and a pattern that just continues. I, I want to press into this question. What is it about human psychology that makes it so difficult for, you know, the people in the congregation, the congregants, or even maybe the staff to recognize that a pastor or another spiritual leader is actually in fact spiritually abusing those he should be shepherding or caring for? What is it that makes it for the masses in the church or the staff to not recognize this is happening? Well, I would think it's a very similar dynamic in a situation in a marriage where let's say a wife knows her husband is having affair after affair after affair and she doesn't confront him because to do that is gonna alter her life. So she lives with the lies and the pretense and the terrible wounding to her um, in order to preserve her situation, status, whatever. So we do the same thing in the church. You know, if, if this is confronted and dealt with, number one, we're gonna be in all the headlines today uh, and we're gonna lose things. We're gonna lose everything. And oftentimes the people in the first circle of leadership after the lead person is as invested in the system existing and the status they have as the person who's abusing the power there. And so, you know, we've seen that with churches that have been exposed over the last years, that the group of elders did everything they could to keep it going and make it be okay. And we do that by telling ourselves that this is a good thing, a church is a good thing. We have new people coming in who really love this place. We're teaching people about God, you know, whatever. We tell ourselves that those things outrank righteousness, hmm. truth, you know. So as long as that's the case, and again, that's what they did in, in Jerusalem with the temple, those things outrank righteousness. And part of the reason for that is also because human beings know that righteousness costs I mean, Jesus did get crucified for his, <laughs> right. you know, so we are threatened by that. If I tell, we'll lose all of these good things. And everybody's worked so hard and it's a blessing to people and all those things. And so we don't want to pay the cost that righteousness and truth would bring. I mean, that's, that's essentially what happened with the Ravi Zacharias thing. You know, it's knocked a, a global organization flat. Yeah, it has. And, you know, we saw the same um, with Willow Creek, not just that yes. church, but because that church was so influential as yes. a global leadership summit and planning other churches. Many of the churches we have today are, are based on that particular model. Mm -hmm. where the, the system was not healthy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a shame, right? Because sometimes the simple truths are so complicated to implement and, um, and that's why it can get so confusing. And, um, and especially I think if there's any sort of gaslighting involved where you mentioned spiritual abuse, where somebody might see something and say something and it's reframed or reworded to be a completely different story where now it's the, the whistleblower's fault. Um, what have you seen about that in those cases? Well, the whistleblower is a great scapegoat, you know, for the system, because it's usually not somebody with a lot of power. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been abused. <laughs> you know, if they were part of the inner group, that wouldn't have happened to them, though sometimes it does. But, but the point is, they're, uh, they're very vulnerable to being uh, called all sorts of things, cut off. And everybody will justify it because they're protecting the church by doing that. There's a quote, which I can't quote exactly. I, I think it's somewhere in the book, but it's by Oswald Chambers, who basically says, nothing 
other than love and obedience to Christ should have priority. <clears throat> and then he goes on to say that the greatest threat to that priority is service for him. Mm. And we confuse our service with his glory and his priority and things like that. And so we preserve our service and its parts, its buildings, its meetings, its everything else, rather than preserve love and obedience to him, no matter the cost. Mm. That's what he calls us to. Yeah. It's a hard road to travel, right? Because, you know, I, I heard someone say once um, when they first, as a pastor, when they bought their first house, um, that they were told, well, now you're going to have trouble doing the right thing. Because there's something about the financial piece, the stability. I mean, I live in Silicon Valley. We're in the most expensive housing in the whole United States. Um, so to, you know, to call anything out in, in a church here would, would be devastating, you know, um, financially. And so there, there are huge prices to pay. Um, and so I think that's why it's, it's so hard. It's so hard to do the right thing. It is. Oh, it is. It's frightening. Yeah. And again, you go back to our Lord who said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Yeah. Yeah. But not, <clears throat> not our will, but his be done, right? It's a prayer we should pray every morning, every night, and all throughout the day because there's always these temptations to do the right or the wrong thing. And um, and it's we need God to help us because how could we how could we go forward making decisions that would got caused such ramifications for us financially when we have you know if you're parents and you have children mouths to feed and um and it seems like for the greater good those choices are often the wrong ones <laughs> right and they're happening all the time but it is that it's that year where people are it's it's just hap it, it's all the time i'm sure in your work you've you've seen it all the time but it just feels like it's exponentially out there because of maybe social media or whatever but um for the church to be a witness to the world, if the conversation is this church is doing so much good, look at all the baptisms, look at all the people coming to know Jesus, look at the impact in the community. And for you to say something would mean you would, you would um, change an opportunity for the church to be a witness. But there is this element that being a witness to the world when they already see these things in the news that we're doing is to do the right thing and stand for righteousness, like you said. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think we are generally fearful of taking that step because of the risks involved and the damage that will be done. But I think that we forget that number one, the damage is already done. It's like cancer, you know, and, and you, you see a lump on your back or somebody tells you there's one but it's gonna completely do stuff to your life if you go get it looked at and have to have something done. And so you would choose to ignore the cancer so you could still take care of your life and do your work and take care of your family and all of those things. But the odds are if it's cancer, it's gonna grow and kill you. It will take longer. Then you know it will be a disruption later as it grows. That's essentially what we're doing. The, the, the lying and the darkness and the hiding and the calling things by their wrong name instead of truth, um, we're ignoring the lump. And the victims that we've been hearing from for some years now, which are increasing in their voices, are telling us about the lump. They wouldn't exist if the cancer weren't there. And they are pointing it out and saying, this is not only killing me, it's killing everybody. But we don't want it to be true. We don't want it to be true. Mm -hmm. And again, you go back to Jesus and his response to the temple and they didn't listen. And what happened? The cancer grew and Rome came in and flattened the whole place. So we are failing to understand and listen and obey him. Hmm. The other thing is we're failing the abusers. If, so, if They have cancer already. 
you can see the growth, you can see the fruit of it by the way they treat people, by the way they completely, I don't know, somebody's abused 10 women or whatever it is. We're not loving them. The best thing that we can do for them is turn the light on so that they can see, hopefully, and invite them to see and hear because they're killing themselves spiritually if they haven't done it already. We're not loving them. We're using them to protect the system. And we're leaving them in their deception and their darkness and the damage to themselves and to everybody around them. This looks nothing like our Lord. Nothing. Yeah. Our Lord, who is gentle and kind to women who who seem to just have a great delight in finding those on the margins who are powerless, overlooked, dishonorable, and spending time honoring and respecting them. You know, that's, yes. that's the God we serve. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which is why if we're going to be a witness to the world, that's the, that's the Jesus we want to reflect and not some, I mean, there's just one King and it's King Jesus and no one else. Well, and the best way to serve him is to look like him. Hmm. Let him transform us to look like him. I mean, he, you know, he, again, he, he's the word made flesh and he came in the flesh so we would understand the father. Well, now we're that. So if you want people to understand God and his great love and his righteousness and all of those things, we have to be the word made flesh. That's not what we're doing with this. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious to know what you would like to say to someone who's maybe noticed something that seemed like, you know, abuse of power in their church. And maybe they feel like the culture of fear toward them saying that if they give this feedback, even this small little bit of information, that their character will be assassinated. Maybe they would be accused of, you know, especially a stereotype about women would be malicious gossip, you know. Uh, or disrespecting authority, I don't know, manipulating, causing disunity. These are all character assassinations they're probably afraid of when they come forward. So or an out-and-out out liar. <laughs> yeah, exactly, for sure. What would you say to that person who might be listening that's noticed something but is afraid? Well, number one, they have a right to be afraid. I understand that. Uh, the truth of the situation is frightening and personally frightening as well. I would, for the most part, not encourage people to go into the situation all by themselves. So you first, you need, you need to talk to somebody or somebodies who are safe people who will help you think through how to do this in as wise a way as possible, but also as strong as possible, as, you know, full of light as possible. Um, so people tend to vacillate between not saying anything or going in without a safety net. And I don't mean that in terms of physical things. I mean that in terms of care of you, you know. So have you ever talked to anybody about it? Have you ever sought out somebody for wisdom about what to do with this? Are there steps to take? So you do one thing first and see what happens. And then you do a second thing if that doesn't have any impact and then a third and things like that. Um, and th that would be true, not just with churches, but also with abuse in a, in a home, uh, unless it's of a child, in which case that's a whole different matter. Um, but you have to be cared for, not in a frightened, I won't do anything because I'm afraid way, but in a way to speak the truth, be bold, and yet have others who walk with you on that journey. Um, because it's a hard road and it's a lonely road and you need their support and their prayer and things like that. So I would encourage them first to find a safe person or several persons uh, to be with them reading about it i talk to some people who've been through it you know i do all those things and then figure out what what your steps need to be and what are you going to do with this response or that response or whatever and you know it depends sometimes it's a church that has a hierarchy not in the church but in the denomination if it's an independent church that's different there's no, there's nobody to go to after the church um, and so there's no safety net which is 
you know, difficult for the person who's telling, but it's also difficult for the congregation and things like that. And I think you also, with all of those precautions, have to be prepared to be a, a one of the lepers. <laughs> you know, that you will be someone they don't want to hear, that they find threatening, and they will find a way to discredit. Yeah, because that's certainly the pattern we've seen over and over and over again. And it's clear in the Ravi case, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where the whistleblowers happened years ago, even, and they still were ignored. Even people who had no reason to lie, and it wouldn't make sense if they were, and um, just yes. yeah, assassinated. Their characters assassinated, and you know the focus being put on the ministry and less on the victims, and their they've lost their community and they probably need some good counseling and but the focus is on the abuser so often. Yes. So let's focus now on the, the abuser. And so many people who might be abusing others may not even recognize that they are. And so I may have some people listening to this podcast who are suddenly realizing things that they've done as we've been talking have been harmful and they want to do the right thing. So, you know, what would you say to maybe there's a man listening who may be a leader of a church or an organization and they have power. They've even maybe created a culture where there's an exclusive inner circle that makes all the decisions and protects him. It, he's probably asking, is it really inherently bad that so many churches have this kind of model of, of leadership where God has put him in this position and sometimes people just get hurt. What would you say to that person who there's a tinge of hope that they could, <laughs> they could do the right thing? Well, to say that sometimes people just get hurt and to say, not to say anything about, I need to look at that. I need to understand how that's happening. I need to see how I'm contributing to that is very troubling to me. It's sort of an, oh, well, kind of thing. There's never an oh well in Jesus Christ when it comes to someone who's married. That's not how he responds. He also didn't respond to vulnerable people that way. And I, you know, he, he not only cared for them, but he called out the Pharisees. He called them all sorts of things, actually, <laughs> um, in terms of their treatment of their parents or the, you know, the little ones or the vulnerable or whatever. And so if we're gonna look like him, we have to be willing to hear feedback about ourselves. We need to seek input from somebody who actually knows what they're doing and not just people who are our friends who want us to stay in the position. You know, we need to be willing to hear the truth and then look at it full in the face, which is very hard for any human being to do. And, you know, again, you go back to eat, and what was the first thing Adam and Eve did? They covered it up. That was their first response. They covered themselves. That's the human response to being exposed in terms of their own sin and wrongdoing. And, uh, you know, I would encourage pastors who maybe aren't doing anything like this, but they don't want to do it in the future. You know, look at the questions in the book. Have somebody or somebody's in your life who get nothing out of you in your position, who are willing to walk with you and to poke at you and to think with you and pray with you, and who, if the whole thing blew up, it wouldn't hurt them in the sense that would, of course, but I, I mean, in the sense that they won't work to preserve the system because that's not what they're invested in. They're actually invested in your godliness, which is a whole different thing. That's good. Yeah, I, as you were saying that, it's just a reminder that someone listening might think that they are, are listening to people around them, but the people that they are listening to um, are all in that inner circle. Maybe they've been friends for years. Well, and, and they're invested in the system. Yeah, right. And then sometimes, especially with pastors, one of the things I've noticed is, um, you know, it's sometimes you'll have people who live 
or who may be in a cohort with you. So then maybe they're another pastor of another church. And then, you know, you give each other feedback or you sharpen each other, but they don't really know how you lead because they've never been under your leadership, not in the inner circle. So I think there is this space for people who aren't in the inner circle, but are under a leadership of, um, of someone who might be abusing others. And that's the place they're not receiving feedback or um, it feels threatening when it's brought up, but that's such valuable feedback if it is indeed harming others. It's not easy, like you said, no one wants to hear it. It's very hard, but if your system has a moat around you that only your inner circle can speak into, that's that's a dangerous place, I would say. Absolutely, and I think one of the uh, signs of a healthy leader is they ask, you know, have I ever hurt you? How did I do that? Have I done it more than once? Do you see it as a pattern? You know, I don't want to hurt you. You, you know, you work with me, you work for me, whatever. I want that feedback. And what do you think I need to do to consider that, particularly if what you're talking about you see as a pattern? I mean, uh, you need to go find help. So I don't think, you know, whether it's the secretary of the church or, the, you know, the choir leader or a youth, band, those people don't generally wouldn't feel free to answer that question. No. They'd be terrified that they'd lose their job. Mm -hmm. So there has to be something in the system that allows for that with perhaps someone else in the room. But, you know, I want to know uh, how I impact you for good or ill for my sake so I can learn. Yeah. I mean, most humans don't ask anybody that. <laughs> it's so this, is not, this is not just about pastors or leaders. No. We really don't want to know. Yeah, we don't. Because it's painful to know that you've hurt someone. No one, no one likes that information. But the, I mean, we, as we talk about it, the, the stakes are high. That if you've done it over and over again for years or even decades, and you're at the top of a powerful position of an organization or a church, um, yeah, the stakes are so high. And the scripture is pretty clear on even the, the ramifications for that leader of doing that over and over. Yeah. What would you say, what would you like to say to pastors who may have a blind spot like that? Um, and they're considering at this moment um, that that might be true. You said they should start asking people um, and create safety for them, but are there any other steps they could take um, to kind of make sure they don't have that blind spot? Well, I, I uh, you know, I think I said at the beginning, I have a group practice. I have 17 therapists here. And what, I, I have no idea how many pastors have been through this office uh, on their own, by their own choice, you know, not because something happened and they were told by everybody they needed to come. <laughs> um, we, we've had that too. But, but um, many pastors have come and just said, I need to look at myself and I don't really trust anybody in my sphere to tell me the truth because a situation you know I, I could fire them or whatever so you know they seek it out themselves I would also encourage them you know these things happen for a variety of reasons but sometimes they happen because of exhaustion and pressure some self-induced pressure or demand on the self um, it's completely unrealistic and so we have pastors and leaders coming in who just want to look at their overall lives and, you know, they're on an edge and they know it and they come before they step up, which is wonderful, <laughs> you know, so that they can find ways to care for themselves, which most pastors don't think about doing. I mean, if you're a shepherd, then you just have to, but you're also a sheep. You're not the shepherd. And even the shepherd went up on the mountain to look at the stars. So I don't know how well uh, aspiring pastors are taught to look at themselves, examine themselves, have somebody else speak into their lives, um, understand some of these concepts. I don't think they're very much equipped in those ways before they step into a pulpit, which we, the church, or we, the seminaries, or whoever, are not loving them well if we don't do that. 
putting heavy burdens on them, demanding that they perform. And uh, then when something bad happens, we either cover it up because they're gonna, it's gonna ruin everything or we kick them to the curb and do nothing for them. So I think the church also needs to think about how do we care for our pastors, both in speaking truth to them, but also in nurturing them or making sure somebody does. Hungry pastors in power do not make good shepherds. Mm. That's so true. But people turn yeah. into wolves because they're looking for something to eat. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And you know, you mix COVID in there and all the, the church in decline and the white evangelical church in particular in the U.S. and stress with kids at home online and stress of getting COVID, <laughs> you add all that in the mix and it's been quite a year for pastors out there. So speaking the truth in love is the most loving, brave thing we could do for our, our brothers and sisters that are our lead pastors in particular. And, and I think what you're saying is true, like to find a place like yours, that's, that's going to love them enough to tell them the truth and help them work through the reasons why they're doing what they're doing so that they don't put all their wounds on other people. <laughs> right? Yes. I mean, there's places pastors can go for two weeks every summer. There's all kinds of things out there that have to be deliberately looked for with the purpose of being seen. Uh, certainly being nurtured, but also being seen. Mm, that's good. I mean, you know, I think well, I said to a pastor, so what if four people on your staff came to you at different times, not knowing the other one had, other ones had come and said, you know, when we talk about X or when we have to choose Y or Z, I am afraid to tell you what I think. I mean, what would you do if four people told you something like that? There has to be First of all, an atmosphere where those four people are free to do that. And then there has to be a response that says, wow, I didn't think it was like that, but I guess I am if, you know, and I need to look at it, even if it's one person, they need to look at it. But um, that system is not alive and well in the church. Yeah, exactly. You know, Scott McKnight talks a bit about that and, and Laura Berenger in their book, A Church Called Tove, The Power by Fear Culture. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it's, it's so opposite of Jesus, you know, just yes. first of all, the power, the domineering, you're not, the, the pagans lord one and over one another, but not so with us. We're not supposed to lord over each other. And certainly perfect love casts out fear. And if God is love, why are we leading with fear? Mm -hmm. um, and to, to know that, to get that kind of feedback, man, that is gold. If, if a pastor would listen, but I, I have an, I have an idea. There's quite a few out there who feel afraid to be honest with their Pastor. Of course they do. Of course they do. Yeah. And would not be well received. <laughs> There's a lot of those too. But there are also pastors out there who would seek it if they knew how to do that. Yeah. And it's a beautiful thing when you see it because it does exist. And, it, and we do have many people who are trying to be like Jesus out there. And, um, and that's, that's the models we want to hold up, the examples we want to follow, because they show us how to do it, you know. I'd love for you just to, in this last moment, just if there's anything I didn't ask that you think is important for us to know, especially in light of all the accusations in the news right now with Ravi Zacharias, is there anything that's important for any of these listeners all around the world and churches to know? Well, I guess there's more than one thing because that's why I wrote a book. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Write a book, everyone. <laughs> um, I, I guess what I would say is, you know, I've done this work with abuse and power and all that for, again, almost 50 years. And it has at times been crushingly difficult. Um, and I have told God I quit more than once, <laughs> obviously. I didn't, and he didn't listen. Yeah. He did listen, but, you know. Um, and so I do have some understanding of the pain of it and the weight of it. But I, I would encourage, whether it's victims, who in many ways have become a prophetic voice to the church. Yeah. Nobody thinks about it that way, really, because we hold prophets up, and, you know, the guy in the pulpit is the prophet. Mm -hmm. But actually, the victims 
are prophet, prophet voices because they're speaking the truth in the darkness. Mm. The prophet does. And they're calling us to light and to righteousness. And so I, I think for those of us who are working with these things or seeing these things or feeling overwhelmed by them, what we also want to see is that Jesus is calling us to some degree into the fellowship of his sufferings. There's no church mess that he hasn't carried. There's no church that's not full of people that he died for and loves. This is breaking his heart, which is why we need to respond to it well. But he's asked us to share in his grief. Um, he's called us to share in his righteousness and speak the truth and all of those things. But he's also called us to share in his grief. Um, and uh, that's the only way I know not to become completely. Uh, I don't know, not to give up. He didn't. He's there. And we find him there when we go and seek him in that place. It's a place we want to get away from. We don't want to go there. It's scary. It makes us sad, all those things. He's there. And he's doing something. He's doing something through the voice of victims and through the exposures. The timing is interesting. I don't know what he has in mind, but it's an invitation. The exposures and the voice of victims are an invitation from him to share in his grief and to call his church to righteousness. That's good. Yeah, um, God cares about the church more than we do. The bride of Christ is precious and God will purify. And it is an invitation for us right now um, to not settle for what we have, but to position ourselves for this generation and for the generations to come, our kids, our grandkids, our great grandkids, so that they can inherit better systems. You know, we just have to get better systems that allow victims to be prophetic and be celebrated and not just tolerated or condemned. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Well, if there's someone listening that wants to find your writing and your resources, maybe a pastor who would like to do an intensive counseling to work on their blind spot, how can people find you? The easiest way is through my website, which is just my name, dianelangberg.com. Uh, there's all kinds of videos on there speaking about these issues. The books are on there. There's a blog that I don't get too often on there. <laughs> and there's also a way to access uh, by email the office. Well, thank you, Dr. Langberg. You've just been so full of good information for us today. You know, it really is uh, hard to talk about these topics, um, but if we just ignore them, they're not going to go away. Just like you said, if there's they'll a get bigger, they'll get bigger. If there's a cancer, we need to know. And, um, and it's our work to do to to do the right thing. And it's not easy, but as you said, God dwells in a special way in that kind of suffering and in that kind of purification. And I've certainly experienced that myself uh, and many times in life um, in lots of suffering. My husband and I worked in Indonesia and the tsunami relief that hit the area we were living in in 2004 and learned a lot about trauma. I translated for a trauma counselor and I just learned that God really dwells in a special way when you've been hurt in some in serious ways. And so I just, I hope that people learn that from your work, writing and from your work is that it's not the absence of God, the suffering, that God is certainly there. So thank you for reminding us of that today. You're welcome. All right, take care. You too, thanks for having me. You're welcome, bye-bye. Bye. Well, this was really heavy. It was, it was even heavy for me in the interview. And as I hear her speak and I hear her describe this fellowship of suffering, listening to those who have been hurt and, and just could not stop myself from recognizing the Holy Spirit so present, even in this interview. And this woman who just calls me to follow Jesus in a deeper way whose life really shows me what it means to love like Jesus and listen like Jesus and be curious and care as Jesus did and not to ever put anyone on a pedestal that belongs to Jesus. There is you know, truly only one king. 
And I'm going to just read a quote from her book, Redeeming Power, Understanding Authority and Abuse in the Church, where she talks about the power of personhood. And she says, first to be human is to have a voice. The voice of God spoke everything into existence. To be created in his image is to have a self, to have a voice and creative expression. Abuse of power silences that self and the words, feelings, thoughts, and choices of the victim. Their desires are disregarded and irrelevant. Abuse of any kind is always damaging to the image of God in humans. The self is shattered, fractured, and silenced and cannot speak who it is into the world. And if that is something you have done to someone else in any even unintentional way, I just encourage you to read this book. It's helping so many. A lot of books are written for victims of abuse to help them process the trauma and the healing. And that is certainly a huge need and an increasing need. And yet she has written this book to help us as leaders in the church understand the power that we have, whether we recognize it or not, and how it's meant to be used to redeem and love and let uh, the voices of those around us speak, to be good listeners and to be deep in relationship with people that are made in God's image, just like we are. We're all fallible human beings. We're capable of both good and evil, both together and the same person. And so this book calls us to take a, an honest look at who we are and who God is and what we're intended to be. And, and I, I think it's, it's well overdue, <laughs> but we're so glad to have it in our hands. So I encourage you to get her book, Redeeming Power, Understanding Authority and Abuse in the Church, Diane Lamberg. You can also follow her uh, writing on Twitter and in different places. She speaks in a lot of conferences. I'm sure you can find her videos on YouTube. And, and just let's, let's lean into this conversation. It's important. It's too important to ignore and pretend it's not happening. Um, and, and I just really hope that all of you, especially if you're leaders in the church, wherever you are in the world, will um, be humble enough to be open to the fact that we may have not done everything perfectly. And, you know, even as parents, sometimes, you know, she mentioned we can sometimes use our power in a way that's harming our children and abusive instead of, you know, redeeming them. And we're, you know, we, we have an opportunity to listen to our children, to hear their voice, to let them have their feelings. And sometimes we don't get that right. And so we need to, you know, be open to the fact that on a larger scale, especially within our churches uh, in our systems that we've created, that we could have created something that's constantly hurting and harming others instead of allowing them to speak with the humanity, God, God's own voice that created humanity with his voice and his image being put in us and a voice that we are empowered to share with the world, all of us with equity and belonging. So this is heavy guys. I know I'm prayerful as you're listening to this around the world and how it's landing with you and would love to hear how you're reacting to it. And so feel free to reach out on Facebook or Instagram at a world of difference. Next week, we're going to have Danielle Strickland, a Canadian who has done so much work around the world in Rwanda and helping uh, rescue slaves and just, oh my goodness, her work is very broad and she's a speaker as well. And she's going to come and talk to us this next week uh, regarding some of her own experiences as a woman in the church and her hopes and desires for how we can be better together all around the world. So tune in next week for Danielle Strickland and take care of yourselves this week and reach out to a friend who could be hurting and just listen and give them the opportunity to share their voice with you. See you guys next week. Bye everyone. As we're finishing this episode, if you're thinking, I really wish I could learn more or go a little bit deeper. Well, that's what our Difference Maker community is for. I would love to welcome you in to join the rest of us there. Once again, um, it's only $5 a month to join the price of a latte at your local coffee shop. You can join at our changers tier. Difference Makers is a community that really means so much to me. It's very special because each time I have a guest on the show, I record something um, outside of what we give to just the regular podcast audience where we go a little bit deeper and then I post those video episodes in this community and we can discuss them. But also at the very uh, 
beginning tier, which is our changers tier of this community, you'll get exclusive voting power and help pick podcast topics that give us, you know, more of what we want from your perspective. You'll have access to exclusive um, 30 plus mini sods that aren't out there for the general public. And you'll get every month an exclusive monthly bonus mini sode. At our groundbreakers level, which is $10 a month, you can join and get all of that, but also priority access to submit questions to the podcast. And you'll get an additional two exclusive monthly bonus mini sodes. And at our Trailblazers tier, which is $15 a month, the price of three lattes a month, um, you can get all of that plus also three exclusive monthly bonus minisodes um, and a patron shout out. So I would love for you to join us at any of those tiers. Um, it'll help you come into this community, be in the midst of all of us, other difference makers, and we'd love to hear your perspective. I certainly would. It's a place to engage more with me and the audience around what you like, what you're resonating with, and once again, go deeper with each of our guests. So please join us in this membership community. I would love to hear your perspective and love to share this extra content with you. So show up at patreon.com slash a world of difference.